All right, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. If you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're here. Um, we go straight through books of the Bible, and right now we're in Hebrews, so you caught us on a day where we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. We um, have been walking through Hebrews for several months now, and uh, we're right in the middle of Hebrews 11, which is a list of examples of faith from the Old Testament. Um, also, remember, next week is Lord's Supper. We're going to do that right at the beginning of the second service. It's the first Sunday of the month. So today, as we look at Hebrews 11, we're going to be in verses 17 through 22, because we ended in 16 last week. Uh, as we continue this list of Old Testament saints who show the reader what it means to live by faith. That's the subject of Hebrews chapter 11. The Hebrew Christians, as I tell you pretty much every Sunday, were, were suffering persecution and were tempted to turn from Christ back to the old covenant religion, back to the temple and the priests and the sacrifices and, and, and all of those things. And the writer of Hebrews has repeatedly, all through this book, um, called them to hold fast to Christ, to hold to their confession, even in the midst of their persecution and their trials and all of the things. And at the end of chapter 10, he told them how, told us how. Quoting Habakkuk 2, he said, the righteous will live by faith. And living by faith is how they are to hold fast to Christ and hold fast to their confession of Christ in the midst of all of this hardship and suffering. And then in Hebrews 11, he starts to show them and us what it means to live by faith. And he uses examples from Israel's own history. And we've studied several of these Old Testament exa examples already. And there was a common theme so far in Hebrews 11 that we You've seen they all waited and they all endured hardship and suffering in faith trusting in the future reward that God had promised them which is the message the author wants to get to us and to the, the readers the original readers of this book at the end of chapter 10 before 11 starts he says therefore do not throw away your confidence which has a great reward for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. And then as 11 begins, he starts walking through these examples of living by faith. And as we walk through the first 16 verses, we found in Abel's life that faith commends us as righteous. And then we saw in Enoch's life, faith is necessary to please God. That's where it says, without faith, it is impossible to please God in verses 5 and 6. And then we saw Noah, faith acts on God's word. God gave him a word of judgment that the flood was coming and he built the ark. Um, and then when God called Abram to a land, he said, I'm calling you out of your homeland and away from your father's house to a land and I'm not even going to tell you what land it is I'll just show you when you get there we saw that faith obeys without an explanation and then uh, we looked at we looked at Sarah and her example uh, faith endures uh, or no not Sarah sorry faith endures seasons of waiting showed us Abraham Isaac Jacob living in tents without ever in their lifetime seeing the fulfillment of promise and then Sarah, faith expects God's faithfulness. And then we finally saw that faith looks toward God's eternal reward. So at the risk of beating a dead horse, uh, we're going to continue this outline as Hebrews now shows us the, um, that the future hope was so sure that these Old Testament saints faithfully endured testing and faced death in faith. Toward the end of Abraham's earthly life, he was called to do something unthinkable. And here, in verse 17 through 19, we're taught that faith obeys when, when it just doesn't make sense. The text says this, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Those quotes are very important. 
He considered that God was even able, able even to raise him from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Now, last week, we reviewed the birth of Isaac very quickly. Abraham and Sarah were promised a child, which is impossible in their advanced age, not to mention the fact that Sarah had always been barren, uh, yet God fulfilled his word, and they did. He did the impossible. Isaac was born, and now Abraham had the true heir, the God uh, foretold heir to inherit God's promises. God had fulfilled his word and the future promise was now certain. Everything was just smooth sailing from there on out. Yet at the end of Abraham's life, God commanded him to take his son Isaac to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him. Now this command surely went against everything in Abraham, you know, as a father who loves their son. Not to mention the fact that Abraham himself would be the executioner of his own son. But as bad as that would be, that's not the main dilemma that the writer of Hebrews shows us. He says, Abraham, who received the promises. Well, what promises? Well, that many nations would come from him and that his descendants would possess the land. And he was called to sacrifice Isaac whom God specifically said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. That's a quote from Genesis 21, 12. The command to sacrifice his son, Isaac, wasn't just a test of a father's love for for his son or love for God. The command was for Abraham to basically nullify and undo God's promise. God said it was through Isaac that the promise would be fulfilled. So the promises of God to Abraham couldn't be fulfilled through any old son of Abraham. Just have another one, Abraham. Isaac has to live because God said it's through Isaac that this is all going to happen. Isaac has to live. He has to bear children. So to kill Isaac, to sacrifice him, would cut off all hope that God's promises to Abraham would ever be fulfilled. The command that God has just given Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac seemed to contradict the promise. You said Isaac would be the one through whom all this would would come to pass. Uh, A writer named William Lane says this, When Abraham obeyed God's mandate to leave Ur of the Chaldees, his homeland, he simply gave up his past. But when he was summoned to Mount Moriah to deliver his own son to God, he was asked to surrender his future as well. How could this be? How could God command something that contradicted his own promises? The command doesn't make sense at all. You said Isaac would be the heir and now you want me to kill him. Nothing about this makes sense. Abraham would either have to disobey God's command and refuse to sacrifice Isaac or he would obey God's command, sacrifice his son, and nullify the promise that God made to him. It's an impossible situation, a no-win situation. And it is in these situations, when things don't make sense, that we're tempted to, to pick and choose which parts of God's word we're going to trust in, we're going to follow. The Hebrew Christians to whom this was written could not reject following Christ and go back to the old dead religion and still hope to inherit the promises that they held dear. Today, you can't hold to the promises in faith and at the same time reject the clear commandments of the same word of God that you're trusting in for the promises. We can't say, you know, I hold to grace by faith, trusting that God will supply my every need. He's working all things for the good of those who love him. He will lead me beside still waters and restore my soul. But in this situation, there's no other option for me but just to transgress his commandment. I I can't prosper in this life. I can't have peace in this life. Nothing will work out for me uh, unless I do this dishonest business practice or violate my marriage covenant or, or, or tell a lie to get out of this situation. God knows my heart. He understands that's not living by faith. Notice what Abraham, the man of faith, did. He reasoned. It says in verse 19, he considered, your translation may say reason, it's a word where we get our word logarithm from. He he assessed, he reasoned that God was able even to raise him from the dead, raise Isaac from the dead, from which figuratively speaking, Abraham did receive him back. 
You see what he did? Abraham chose to trust and obey even when God's command didn't make sense. By faith, Abraham refused to disobey God's word and he refused to doubt the fulfillment of God's promise. Though it looked like these two things contradicted each other. Now, for both the command and the promise to be true, he reasoned that God, God would have to raise Isaac from the dead, and he would. Since God cannot lie, Abraham was willing to believe the impossible because he knew no matter what, no matter if I don't understand how these two things work together or, or it doesn't seem like they should work together, he knew that God would be faithful to his word and he would overcome anything and everything to be faithful to his word. Now by saying Abraham thought that God, a reason that God would r raise Isaac from the dead, the, the author of Hebrews doesn't just pull this out of thin air assuming that this was happening. He gets this from the text of Genesis. As Abraham is leading, about to lead Isaac up the mountain to sacrifice him, Genesis 22.5 says, Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. The ESV doesn't make it abundantly clear but Abraham said we are going up there and we will come back to you it's plural he believed Isaac would be coming back down the mountain with him though much about this was difficult to understand I imagine for Abraham he knew that he didn't have to disobey God's command because he trusted that God would fulfill his word no matter what Abraham trusted both the unshakable promise and the seemingly contradictory command. For Abraham, this was God's problem to solve, not his. So Abraham didn't sit around questioning, well, how could this be? Even if he couldn't figure it out, he trusted that God is good. God is faithful to his word. He cannot lie. He will do whatever is necessary to keep his promise. All I have to do is obey his word. This event comes at the end of Abraham's life. Through Abraham's whole life, he had seen God's faithfulness in delivering him over and over again, even from his own sinfulness as he lied twice about his wife. He had seen God provide for him in miraculous ways, not least of which was the birth of Isaac himself. Abraham's faith grew as he walked with God. He wasn't the same man that lied about his wife back in Egypt. So as he grew in faith over his life, <clears throat> the question here wasn't, how can I figure out why God wants me to do this and that? And how is it going to work with my life? And how is it going to work with the promise? The question for Abraham was, do I trust God's word even when it doesn't make sense to me? <clears throat> the Hebrew Christians to whom this was written, man, they... They were seeing much around them that didn't make sense. They had trusted God's word. The Messiah has come and they had trusted in Jesus and they received the promises of salvation and the kingdom and, and the spirit and eternal life forever united with God. God's promises had come to them in Christ. Yet the call to follow Jesus had also come with great cost to them. A lifetime of suffering persecution, denying their own desires, being scorned by pretty much everyone in society. At the end of chapter 10, it listed those. You've been afflicted and you've had your property plundered and you've had all these things happen to you. They were being called by the writer of Hebrews, by the Spirit through the writer of Hebrews, to obey Christ, follow Christ, hold fast to their confession, though everything in their lives looked like God's promise had left them behind. In the same way, God seemed to contradict his own promise to Abraham. The Hebrew readers were feeling this and being tempted to turn back. If I just go back to the old covenant, go back to the temple, go back to the sacrifices, I'm worshiping God. I'm worshiping him the same way I used to, going back to the old life. And if I do that, all this stuff will end. All the persecution will end. All the heartache will end. All the hardship will end. Is it worth it? It just doesn't seem to make sense that God would call me to the heights of glory in Christ and then seemingly leave me in all of this suffering and all of this hardship and all of this pain. Of course, we know that in the end, God spared Isaac and God fulfilled his word 
by giving the promises through Isaac. Sometimes God's commands don't make sense to us. We don't understand why. What are you doing here that in the midst of all this? How is obeying this word, this command, whatever it may be, how is that, how could that possibly be for the best when I know it's going to cause suffering, when it's as calling me to deny myself? We battle as our flesh tells us all the reasons why God's clear commands aren't good, won't end up good, or don't apply to me in this certain situation. Christians, we don't get to say which parts of God's word are best for us, which parts we're going to follow. We have the promises, we have the commands. Either both are true or neither. And let me say one more thing. As Christians, listen, we don't find our peace, our fulfillment, our comfort, our whatever you want to say. We don't find our peace in being able to solve the puzzle. Or, or unravel the intricate workings of God's purposes and plans and, and how this functions and how this is going to make life. We, our peace doesn't come from that at all. Our peace comes from knowing God is faithful. He is working for our good in Christ. And we trust God even when it doesn't make sense. Amen. He is our peace. Because unlike Abraham, who God stopped from sacrificing his son... The Father did sacrifice His Son so that we would be reconciled to Him and possess the promises, even as we remain in this fallen world with suffering and disease and hurt and death. If God would do that for us, give His only Son, if Christ would willingly take on flesh and come and offer Himself on the cross, we don't ever have cause to doubt his love, to doubt his care, to doubt his, his working for our good, even when things don't make sense to us. In Romans 8, 32, it says, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Faith obeys when it doesn't make sense to. Next, the author shows us the end of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph's life. As they died, not having received the promises yet, they owned no land. Their offspring owned none of the land that was promised to him. They weren't a great nation yet. Uh, they weren't uh, any of those things. They faced death, these men, with faith. At Isaac's death, we see that faith submits our will to God's. Now, verse 20 says, By faith Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. That's it. <laughs> Most of the time, my, my goal is always for the preaching point to be above the verse, and you should be able to read the verse and see where I got the point. That's not what happened right here. <laughs> but the point is in the story of Isaac blessing Jacob and Esau. So the Hebrew readers knew this. They didn't have to go into detail. They knew it. They knew it by heart because they had been brought up with it. When Isaac's twin sons, Jacob and Esau, were born, God said to Rebekah in Genesis 25, And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. Y'all remember that, right? So right at their birth, we're told God's purposes were for Jacob, not for Esau, to inherit the promise. But as they grew into adults, what happened? Isaac loved Esau more than Jacob. Esau was Isaac's favorite son. And when it came time, as Isaac was blind and lay about to pass, the promise and blessing to his heir that he was supposed to give, Isaac didn't follow what God said at the children's birth. He just decided, Esau is my favorite son. I'm going to give the promise to Esau. I'm going to give the blessing, the inheritance. He will be my heir. And when this became known, you know the story, but I'm going to tell it anyway. Rebecca and Jacob deceived Isaac, who was blind, by dressing Jacob up as Esau. You know, the goat's hair and all that stuff on him. So he'd smell like Esau. 
Isaac would unknowingly give Jacob the blessing. So by deceit, uh, Rebecca and, and, and Jacob received uh, Rebecca. Rebecca and Jacob deceived Isaac, and Jacob received the inheritance the heir, as heir of God's promise. Now, thinking through that story, you think, why in the world was Isaac commended for his faith in blessing Jacob this way? He didn't want to. In fact, where is faith in anywhere in this story? No one acted in this story according with God's will here. Isaac didn't have faith in God's choice of Jacob. Rebekah didn't have faith that God would overrule Isaac's choice and she lied and deceived. You know, she, she did exactly what Abraham didn't do. She didn't obey God, trusting that he would take care of his promise. And Jacob, who's just a deceiver anyway, I mean, he's just along for the ride. How can the author of Hebrews say that by faith Isaac blessed his sons? He can say that because of what happens next. Notice, we read, we read way too fast sometimes and don't focus on what's actually said. We know that story and it should say by faith Isaac invoked future blessing on Jacob. But it doesn't. It says, by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. We often forget that part of the story. Why is that important? So Jacob tricked his father, right, and received the blessing. But when Isaac learned what happened, instead of exploding in anger, revoking the blessing and cursing Jacob, I, Isaac simply said, I've blessed him and he shall be blessed. Even the tears of Esau, his favored son, didn't sway Isaac to reverse his blessing. And we're shown why when Isaac later gives a different blessing to Esau. In Genesis 27, it says this, Then Isaac, his father, he's talking to Esau here, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and look at it, you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. You see what he says? The elder will serve the younger. Isaac had come to accept what God said at the children's birth. Isaac understood that God had over... I think he understood that God had overruled his will, bringing his promise to pass that the elder would serve the younger, despite him deciding all by himself that Esau is going to get the promise. Isaac yielded and acknowledged the word and the purposes of God. He ceased arguing with God's word and accepted that the older would serve the younger. In fact, in Genesis 28, 1, he blesses Jacob again, knowing full well that it's Jacob. In this example of living by faith, we see that not only did, not only did Isaac have faith that the promises would be fulfilled in the future, but we see him come to accept and trust God's will and God's word, though he had previously fought against it. The Hebrew Christians suffering, they might well be fighting against God's will for their lives as well. The temptation to return to the old covenant practices would definitely give them an easier life. And all their persecutions, all their sufferings would cease if they would just do it. Disobeying Christ, forsaking Christ, turning from Christ looked like it would bring them comfort and peace. But by God's grace, he brings those who live by faith one way or the other to see that God's word is faithful. Even if it flies in the face of our own desires, our own will. Isaac's desire was for Esau to have the blessing. It tells us that at some point... You have to stop fighting with God. Have to stop fighting against His Word and trust His Word and trust His plan. Faith submits our will to His because we trust Him more than we trust ourselves. And sometimes for His children, God brings great discipline and chastisement in bringing that to our minds. Finally, we see that faith endures to the very end, even in the face of death. By faith, Jacob, when dying, 
blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. And then he shows us by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. As Genesis ends, both Jacob and Joseph die in Egypt, not yet possessing any of the ground that God had promised them. Joseph, of course, who you know this story as well, who had risen to power in Egypt by God's providence, brought Jacob and his family to Egypt, and they were given land and wealth by Pharaoh because of Joseph. And remember, this is years before they were enslaved by the Egyptians. Yet even though they lived in comfort, they lived in the land of Goshen that was given to them by the Pharaoh. They lived in comfort. Both Jacob and Joseph still died looking forward to the promise. And both said so. As Jacob lay dying before he speaks a blessing over his other 11 sons, in Genesis 48, he blesses the two sons of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. Effectively, Jacob adopts them into the tribe of Israel, including them in the promises, in the inheritance among God's people. He believed the fulfillment would come and he blessed them and he even worshipped God at the time. Bowed down upon his staff, it says here. He was thankful to God, though he's about to die not seeing the fulfillment of the promise that was given to him. He looked forward to the fulfillment of it, knowing that he wouldn't see it in his lifetime. Listen, facing death in faith is no small thing at all. Because in verse 22, he talks about Joseph. If you know anything about Joseph's life in Genesis, you know, we, we talk about how all these people were sinners and they were all just like us. They weren't perfect people and Joseph wasn't either. But there isn't anything in Genesis but good about Joseph. There isn't anything but faithfulness about Joseph. But of all the exciting and faith-filled events of Joseph's life, the author of Hebrews could have drawn from any of those. It's Joseph's death that he uses as an example for the Hebrew Christians. Joseph rose to the highest power in Egypt under Pharaoh. He enjoyed luxury and wealth in Egypt, though the early years of his life were very hard, a lot of suffering. But even in the lap of luxury with no hardship or suffering, power and wealth and fame and all of the things, Joseph still looked forward in faith to the promise of God. He looked forward to the day when Israel would leave Egypt, when God would bring them out in the Exodus and they would go back to the land of promise. He longed for the promise so much that he didn't even want his bones to remain in Egypt. He wanted them to take his remains to the land with them when God fulfilled his word and bury him there. Joseph understood that even from his exalted position in Egypt, when he had pretty much everything the world had to offer, he was not home yet. He knew his future lay with the promises of God. These men died in faith, enduring, waiting, holding on to a promise that they never saw fulfilled in this life. They were looking for a city whose designer and builder is God, as it said earlier in this chapter. The message to these suffering Hebrew Christians is clear. Your forefathers held fast to the promises. You must do the same in your present circumstances. Remember, the author is dissuading the Hebrews from, from returning to the old way, from returning to the old covenant. He's telling them to hold on to Christ despite the hardships, despite the suffering, despite what it means for you in your life, despite what your heart is telling you, your flesh is telling you. He's calling them to follow Jesus' will and word no matter what because he's better. A life without suffering is not worth forfeiting the promises for even if it results in your death. They needed to see these promises as their forefathers did, more precious and valuable than anything else. Jesus is better. 
We so often as modern believers who are not facing real persecution and real suffering for our faith in Jesus as so many people in history and so many people around the world are even today, we have a romanticized view about what it would be like if we were forced to face death or deny Christ. I remember a story somebody told me, I don't know whether it's true or not, but he said, a young man said, well, I'll be happy to die for Jesus. And the old lady behind him says, you don't even get out of bed when it's raining. <laughs> if Jesus is truly better, as the book of Hebrews claims, then there's nothing worth turning from him for. Jacob and Joseph faced death in faith, knowing that they would not live to see the fulfillment of these promises, but trusting that the promises of God were certain and they were more valuable than all of this stuff that God has given me in Egypt, Joseph might say. Wealth and power and, and prestige and fame and all of the things that Joseph had. And these men, Jacob and Joseph, they met death with joy. Jacob worshiped on his staff. In the Hebrew of Genesis, it says on his bed, but the Greek translation says on his staff. That's what the author's quoting. Joseph said, one day God's going to bring you out of this land. I know you got it good right now and everything's fine and you got all that you could ever ask for, but one day God's going to bring you out of this land. Take my bones with you when you go. They met death with joy looking for eternal reward. They knew that even death itself cannot undo the promises of God. That is huge. I've seen a lot of people die. As a pastor, as a hospital chaplain, I've been at a lot of people's bedside when one moment they are alive and the next moment they have passed on. I've seen a lot of people die with fear and terror. I've seen a lot of people die with joy and expectation, knowing that they were going to a better life. I've seen a lot of people die in palliative care when they're asleep and you can't do anything. You can't talk to them. You can't. It is huge. When you see a person, we can say whatever we want right now because right now, you know, we're all thinking about a cheeseburger. But when you're, when you're there and you're in the bed and, and the doctor says, this is it. You're, you're not going anywhere. This is, this is where you're, these are your last days. It's then when you see person who lives by faith. They can look at the coming death of their physical body and even rejoice, even rejoice in this time for they trust the promise of God. Listen, I, I, uh, where is, I'm reminded of Miss Gunther's death family around her just laughing and talking and cutting up and telling jokes all the way up to the time she passed away. Trusted. Knew where she was going. Listen, I know there, there are deathbed confessions and conversions and all that and you trust in Jesus at any point in your life and you're saved, but over the experience that I've had, I can say that no one faces death in faith who doesn't live by faith. That's his point. As we saw in chapter 10. Remember I read it to you right at the beginning. Therefore do not throw away your confidence. Which has great reward for you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God. You may receive what is promised. Hold fast. After he said this in Hebrews chapter 10. The very next verse. He says. Oh, no. The very next verse in chapter, in chapter 10, he says, The righteous will live by faith. Hebrews 11 shows us what that faith looks like. The Hebrew Christians who would live by faith, just as Abraham, Jacob, Joseph, Enoch, Noah, all of these must hold fast to Christ and not go back 
No matter what they think, what benefit it would come from it. They must hold to Christ because Christ is better. He's the fulfillment of all of God's promises. He is the yes and the amen to everything God has declared, every blessing He has promised to His people. And the same is true for us today. Christians, we must keep watch on our hearts and minds because we are always tempted to forsake following Christ for other things. Whether it be self, whether it be pleasure, whether it be money or fame or whatever, we're always tempted. We must see this battle for what it is. When our flesh, the world, or the devil lead us from uh, uh, following God's will... In Jesus, we must immerse ourselves in God's Word to hear what God says and live that out by faith. Now more than ever, we have to heed the warning of Hebrews chapter 3 that we read so many months ago. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day as long as it's called today that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ... If indeed we hold our original confidence to the end. The very next verse in that passage says, Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. What's God been calling you to, believer? What's he been calling you to lay down? To repent of? To trust in? Where's he been calling you to serve? To witness the disciple? Today, he may be calling you to salvation in himself. Today, if you hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. I said I've seen a whole lot of people die as a pastor and as a chaplain, a hospital chaplain. And most of the time, most of the time, those people are usually on palliative care. So don't take the gamble Palliative care means they're comfort measures and they're asleep and they're resting. Don't take the gamble of saying, well, I'll get it done right there at the end. You may not. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Let's pray. Father, we do love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for all that you have given us in the blessings and the promises through Jesus Christ. We thank you that it's not of works, lest any man should boast, but it is by faith. Just as all of these Old Testament saints lived by faith. It is by faith in Jesus Christ that he died for me, that he rose from the grave for me, that he sits exalted in the heavens at the right hand of the Father interceding for me. It is trusting that Jesus is enough and that he is sufficient and that he is better. Father, I pray that if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that hasn't trusted in you, hasn't entrusted their life, their soul to you, that you gave your son to pay for their sins, Father, I pray that you would call them to yourself. Pray that you would draw them, that you would show them the cross, the empty tomb. God, and that you would show them their need. God, I pray that you would move today amongst us that you would save souls for your kingdom, and that you would prepare our hearts as believers to live by faith. You're calling all of us in this room to different things in different ways and different, in different places. God, I pray that you, would, that you would help us to live by faith, trusting that your way is the best way, for Jesus Christ is better than all. God, we thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As always, I'll stand right down here. If you want to come, I'd love to pray with you. Will you stand with me?